Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix. If you've been watching my videos over the last uh, six months or so, you know that I've started to edit more and more uh, MVS and, uh, and I guess also VM programming more and more on, the, uh, on my workstation instead of doing it inside MVS or instead of doing it inside VM. Uh, I like the ISPF editor a lot. I even like the rev edited uh, editor in MVS 3.8 even more than the ISPF and I love the X edit editor in, in VM as well but um, they're um, really kind of uh, outdated uh, there's no syntax highlighting at all in X edit and uh, the syntax highlighting on rev edit or ISPF is very weak especially if you do um, uh, programming that goes into many hundreds of lines or I would say anything over two three thousand lines starts to be very tedious to do on uh, on the mainframe directly and so um, I've started to edit things in Vim um, sometimes even in VS code if you really have to and then uh, bring them on to the uh, mainframe then to uh, to compile and uh, link and edit and uh, give it a run now uh, one of the things that I've also uh, kind of didn't like so much is that sim simple syntax checking if you have a syntax and you don't know if that syntax is going to be legal or not uh, since there is no good syntax highlighting let's say for uh, mainframe assembler there's no good syntax highlighting for that on uh, on vim and there's also no good syntax highlighting for that on the on uh, on the editors we have on the mainframe and so often, you know, you have to run the whole job, which means the JCL, you have to put in the, uh, the source code, and then you have to compile it, and then you have to switch to the output viewer, or I have to use uh, the amazing uh, virtual 1403 system that Matthew Wilson and I set up, and then have it send it to me, and then I have to open it. It's, a, it's very tedious. So sometimes I would like to have the possibility to just put in somewhere, uh, ideally in a browser, some, uh, some assembler code, or maybe even COBOL code, and just check the syntax without having to run a full um, a full uh, job for that. But let's first switch to the commercials. Morning, Miss Stevens. Good morning, Mr. Lewis. After you buy IBM equipment for your business, we don't stop trying to make it even better. And if we make an engineering change, as part of our maintenance agreement, an IBM service representative will stop by and make the change. You ask it. Good as new? Better than new. Our service representatives don't just keep your machines running. They make your machines run better. He said it was better than new. Think he can fix a 53 Studebaker? IBM. And we're back. I decided to, uh, to build this, and in fact, I have built it. And today we're going to see that I have actually built it for two different platforms. One is for the ZOS uh, Unix System Services platform, USS, which is kind of kind of like a Unix, uh, but very tedious to work in, and as you will see in a moment. And then also uh, did the same thing again on uh, Linux on the mainframe, so that uh, it's always running on the mainframe somewhere, but uh, it gives you the possibility to copy and paste some uh, some uh, assembler source code as you see here in this example very simple uh, program uh, my name um, using etc etc just a very simple assembler program and now i can uh, click on this button and inside the browser i get the output from uh, the high level assembler which is compatible of course with the assembler uh, instructions we have on mvs 3.8 so that will work for that as well and um, then i can go and see uh, what the assembler does with it. Obviously, uh, I see here load address results in uh, instruction code 41. Um, uh, uh, then we have a system call or a service call, um, 0A, etc., etc. And you also get all the beautiful things that uh, high level assembler does, which is the register usage. Um, you get the reference, the relocation dictionary. 
the cross-reference, uh, the size of the resulting object file, which libraries were used. And the good thing here is also that it does use the Mac library. So the macro libraries, a sys1 macro library and sys1 mod gen and, uh, and even the common um, language uh, libraries for the mainframe uh, for ZOS. Uh, the CEE, the CMAC. So it uses all those. So you could actually put real macros in it and it will uh, it will go and uh, find out uh, the usage of those micros, macros and then you get um, a very nice listing, which then if you had an error, so we can try to do that. So for instance, we can say here some illegal instructions, uh, illegal instructions, so something like that. This instruction does not exist. As far as I know, <laughs> sometimes it's difficult because they've been adding many thousands of new instructions over the last uh, 20 to 30 years. So, but I don't think that instruction exists. And so now we compile it again and now, or assemble it again, and it should now say um, undefined operation code trail uh, record four. So there is no uh, such instruction. And so the good thing is that it's very quick. So I can just copy and paste uh, um, my code in there i don't have to set up a whole job and run it sometimes also uh, there's some uh, problems if you have those compile link and go uh, or assemble uh, and go uh, jobs and let's say that you have a vsan definition then you also have to put in um, all the processing in case that you know there's an error in the processing of the source but it already allocated the vsan so you have to go and first delete it so it's much simpler to just if you just want to do the assembler uh, syntax checking to do it this way and so that's how i, I did it and um and so today we're going to see how i got this working for both uh, the unix system services on zos but also in a obviously much simpler way also on linux and i'll show you the code and everything that's behind uh this very simple uh, uh this very simple website so of course um I, maybe i should mention that this only looks like it's ispf this is just a normal website uh there is no ispf here this is all just all fake um i i have uh, i designed this so that it will look like it's inside an ispf but this is just this is just HTML. The, it's not really, uh, it's not really um, uh, anything that's running on the mainframe. This whole website is just HTML. Uh, of course, this all work, um, uh, band codes, but they're all just HTML programs running somewhere in the uh, background with some scripts attached to them or some Go program, Go programs attached to them. So let's go see um, how we. I got this thing to work. So. Um, So what I did here is I'm connected to um, Unix um, system services on a, on a real mainframe. Um, as you can see here, uh, even though this is EOS 2.4, I think, um, because of reasons that I'm not going to get into, it still shows OS 390. But this is ZOS uh, 2.4. And um, there's two important things that happened with ZOS 2.4. One is that um, you can, of course, run um, some new utilities um, such as bash uh, which i'm running here okay so this is bash and um and it's very important because uh, uh if you're able to compile some new utilities like bash then you get a, a decent shell because the shell that's uh, supplied with uss which is the normal uh, shell is a total disaster there's no um there's no completion there is no um there is no uh recalling of previous uh, commands you can't uh, edit within the line like I like I can do here go to the beginning of the line go to the end of the line none of this exists so uh, you really need a decent shell to be able to operate so that's one thing that happened that's good the other thing that happened is that we have a an assemb uh, uh, sorry a go uh, compiler for the first time with ZOS uh, 2.4 and it's go version 116 which is good enough as you can see here, Go version 116 for ZOS on S390. So this is not Linux. This is uh, ZOS, as you can see here. As you as you probably know, for the last 30 years or so, um, MVS ESA, I think, introduced it, and then OS390, and then ZOS has contained something called USS for Unix System Services. And I think 
the abbreviation stayed, but I think a couple of times they changed the name, as they sometimes do at IBM. But uh, there is a Go compiler. Why is that important? Because uh, if I can work in the shell and if I can uh, uh, create a Go compiler, if I have a Go compiler, I can do two things. I can write a very simple web server, um, which is exactly what you saw in the browser uh, just now. Um, uh, this is running is actually served by not by any Apache or Liberty or whatever IBM or web whatever they call them um, but um, it's actually my own web server which I wrote myself and um, and so what we're going to see now is that um, combining these two things having some very simple new tools new tools like bash and the go lang compiler allows me to create what you just saw there in the browser. So let's get started. Um, I have here, uh, we can see, first of all, let's look at the Go compiler, uh, at the uh, web server that I wrote. Now, the web server is extremely simple. Um, uh, I'll, I'll skip through the more complicated stuff. First of all, of course, we log IP addresses to see if there's any bad guys attempting things. Uh, but I only have really a couple of uh, handlers here. One is for the index, one is for about, if people want to find out what this website is about, and then um, the ASM um, page where people can put in some input, uh, the assembler um, source code, and then the result with, uh, which is another HTML page where the result and the output from the uh, high level assembler um, compilation step or assembly step will be shown. So very, very simple. Uh, I can decide, of course, on which uh, on which uh, port I want to serve. This is going to be standard port 80. And um, and so here is just, this is the main function. It just starts, I put some uh, message on the console, goes to the heartbeat. What is the heartbeat? The heartbeat is just once an hour. This is a separate thread. The good thing about Go is that threading is extremely simple. So this is a separate thread that once an hour just prints, uh, prints something on the console so I know if it crashes more or less the time it crashed with a, with a resolution of one hour. I could also make it five minutes. As you can see here, uh, I can make it an hour, 10 hours, whatever. And, um, and so um, with the built-in uh, list and serve, which is uh, the HTTP uh, uh, package. Uh, also, the VI uh, editor on Unix system services is very, very simple. Of course, it's not Vim. I think Vim has been ported for uh, ZOS, USS, but I'm not sure. But uh, many of the commands that exist for Vim, of course, don't exist. So you can see here, this is the uh, net HTTP, which has a built-in uh, ability to handle web requests i can uh, look at the agent you can extract lots of code and um and so here's the assembler handler let's see what happens so when if somebody goes slash assembler uh, slash asm it will land in this function uh, we get the ip address and we log it uh, and then we render an acm.html uh, page so we just basically render a page when that page now which is what you've seen before here um, this thing here um, let's move so um, if people put in where is it again if people put in this the source code then eventually it will land in the uh, the hand the result handler which what it does is it renders in a result HTML page. We're going to look at this both this uh, both these HTML pages in a second. ASM, which is where you put the input, the source, and then once you press uh, go compile, then I will compile and they will the result will be shown here. Result HTML. So let's remember ASM.html and result.html. So then um, we first render that page and then we execute a shell command in ZOS Unix system services with the output that was given with the with the uh, argument which is the source code that the user put in in the web page so if you put in that source code that we just saw in, in assembler that's going to be now in var content string the content one uh, string is going to be uh, populated from the html 
uh, button which has this uh, source uh, name and so old whatever it's put in there will now become part of the string content one which then we pass to the shell and the shell will take this content which is the whole source code and do something with it and then once we've done that then we write the output and we return back so this is extremely quick extremely reliable i've had web servers like this running for uh years now um, and there's no maintenance it's extremely simple i don't really like to work with apache or nginx all that kind of stuff now you some people will say this has no uh, https I could, I would just have to go get a, a certificate and then um, if I put in here, that's very simple actually, if you've ever done it, TLS, um, and then you put in here uh, the certificate, the private certificate, the public certificate, and that's it. Um, and then it just listens on uh, 443, uh, but it's extremely simple to do. So um, we're not going to do that now, but uh, you know what I'm uh, it's probably done it yourself many times, so let's not waste too much time. So now let's look at those uh, HTML pages. Now, if I use the vi command, which is the the editor that's 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 supplied by IBM as part of the USS, and uh, would uh, then edit something like let's say ASM HTML, you see something like that. Why is that? Because uh, Go is UTF-8 based. So it needs the UTF character set. And that means also the web pages that go with the, um, that, that are rendered by this Go uh, based web server have to be in UTF-8 format as well. So that's why I had to uh, do something and I create actually two invert VI environments. One is with, um, minus w file code set iso 88591 which is the um which is the utf8 um character set and if i just type vi then it's without the utf character set so very important so so now if i say vgo which means it's just an alias uh, vgo is just an alias of uh, of V minus W ISO 8859 as, as we just saw, right? So Vigo um, ASM.html. Now I can see the um, now I can see the web page, the very simple web page, and here is the form. So um, first we just rendered it so that it looks kind of like a, an ISPF page, but of course, as I said. It's not really nice uh, an ISPF page. It just it just made to look like that with a CSS, with a cascading style sheet, and then um, we have here um, paste your assembler source code here, and then the box is going to be put in here. We can decide how long we're going to have it. Okay, 650 pixels, um, and how wide we want it, uh, something like that, and um, and then the uh, name where the content that the user put in is going to put it in is going to be source which if you remember source is exactly what the go lang routine handling the result from this html page is looking for so it's going to find it here in source so now let's look, go and look at result.html as you can see here again uh, just css to make it look like it's a web page uh, it's like ispf right as you can see here this is all just make to look like. Um, and it starts to render the top of the page, which is up to about here. Uh, and then it stops. And why is that important? Because we continue to render the page afterwards in the bash script. So that's how I do it. So now if you look at asm.shell, which is the shell command that, um, that uh, the Golang goes and executes after it starts pre-rendering the result page if you follow me this is now the shell now what you if you notice that i'm not saying vigo um asm.shell why because um this is actually going to be executed by uss this has nothing to do with the web server and so therefore uss doesn't execute uh, shell scripts in utf they have to be in and uh, in in the either uh, ascii or epsidic format so that's why um, this has to be uh, in this kind of format and and uh, so it is in the right format let's see what happens here first as you can see here c-span class c i set a color here and 
then I start uh, putting text into that HTML page. So this is something that I put in. And then we say that uh, the argument that the Golang program is passing, if you remember, um, the content one, that variable, uh, is passed to the, to the script. And so therefore it's in one, and we copy it into source. So we can, it's easier to read. And now let's see what happens. So um, there's a lot of transformation happening here. Um, we remove the control M characters and we copy it into, into some other, um, in, into a file. Why do we do that? Well, because if you come from a Golang web page um, or a UTF web page, every end of the line will have a control M. So we need to remove it because the uh, high level assembler in Unix system service doesn't know what to do with that. So we, and you'll see there's gonna be a lot of this character transformations in this video. So now we call the assembler program and the assembler program has uh, several switches, but uh, AS stands for ASMA90, which is uh, the um, alias for the high level assembler because it came out in 9090 for the first time. Um, written by a group led by John Ehrman, who died, I think, two years ago. And then we give all the switches. Um, and we'll see in a second what those switches are. We pass it the, um, the program that we want to assemble. And the output is going to be into temp output list. And then we just cat, uh, basically um, run a cat of that list inside that result HTML page. And it's going to come out fine. Why? Because we have pre here means don't, don't try to render it just leave it as it is um, and um, and then we have at the bottom the line that makes it look like the bottom of an ISPF or, or a TSO page and then we finish and then we close the HTML here so as you can see here we don't start any HTML here we just close the HTML why because we have Vigo result here we open a web page, but as you can see, we don't close it. Why? Because the shell script closes it. So I hope that makes sense. So if you look again now at uh, content one, you will see here that we start rendering a page. What we got from the form that we, uh, first we rendered the form asm.html where people can copy and paste their assembly source code. Then the source code that they put in is gonna be in this uh, source uh, field here, we copy it in there, and then we call assembler.shell, and we pass the content one. Why not assembler bash? Because USS has problems executing bash scripts because they're not uh, part of the uh, accepted. You can you can get it to work, but it's a bit tedious. So I just wrote it in shell, uh, pretty much the same thing anyway. So, um, but it's assembler dot asm dot shell with this content, and as you can see, uh, and we go and get this immediately and put it into source, and then we uh, compile and we look into the compilation step in a second or the assembly step in a second. And then uh, we uh, make the page at the bottom look like it came from TSO ISPF. And then we close the HTML. And so this all actually works fine. <coughs> Excuse me. So now let's see how to um, get a simple Uh, do we have test uh, let's just do it very simple test uh, something like that just to make it and then uh, I think a, a high level assembly does insist on having an end statement. Okay, so now if we want to uh, assembler, assemble that, we can say a, a S, assemble, and you can see here these are all the switches. E for produce external symbol dictionary, produce general purpose register cross-reference, uh, produce macro uh, product information, which we don't use because we're not interested in that, and produce macro and copy source code summary, relocation, etc., etc., and then where you want the object file to be stored, the text file, etc. We don't want to produce an actual object file. What we want to do is, uh, let's say, G, 
um, test ASM and we say test.list. Okay, so now statements flagged. So let's look at that. And you can see here, this is, um, this is exactly what we have. So this is what we also render in the page. So this, all that happens really is we execute this command with the uh, source code uh, that we put into a file as part of the script. Uh, so you can see here, we put that into a, into a file in assembler and then, um, and then we uh, remove some characters, the control M, which uh, Golang puts in there. And then we pass it to the assembler, etc. And then as I think actually one last step here should be um, remove temp dot out list and remove temp in ASM, just to make sure that we don't uh, look at old um, results. So that's it. So uh, this all works fine and it's very simple and um, and it works fine and is reliable because it is so simple, right? And now let's remember again, this is only possible because I have the Go compiler. Um, yeah, you could do a web page also in Bash, but then you need some external commands, which of course here we don't have. Um, everything that comes for GNU is not available here. You would have to go find somewhere and get it to compile. And even just, excuse me, <coughs> Even just getting the new CC compiler to work in here is extremely difficult. Um, so, um, so you know, this wouldn't work if you didn't have the Go compiler, which has the ability to very simply set up a web server. And it also wouldn't work because uh, doing all this work here in the console with the standard shell, I can show you shell, if I want to, uh, there's no, see, I'm looking to complete now this, this file here, share. There is no, if I press tab, it just tabs. And there is no, if I want to go up, meaning that in the history of commands, I can because the cursor just goes up. And there's probably ways to even make it work with bat, with shell, um, completion, etc. Pretty sure it is possible, but bash does it. Um, and for me, bash is the usual environment for me anyway. So um, just with a bunch of HTML files, um, a simple Go web server, and um, and then the built-in high-level assembler of uh, of uh, of USS, we were able to get this to work. Let's look again how this all works. Here it is. Um, here we uh, the trail, of course, doesn't work. I think this should be probably a load. Yep, I think this is a load. So this all works fine. There's only one problem, which is um, to let this run, I have to run this web server once I assemble it, or compile the, the web server with Go uh, build, uh, you get the resulting binary here, uh, which of course the nice thing about Go is there's you don't need libraries, it's all statically compiled. But to run it, then um, I have to run it like that. And uh, I want to be able to launch the web server and log out. Now, of course, on Linux, I would use something like Screen or Tmux or Biobu, um, which are kind of virtual terminals. Uh, I have not been able to find a screen uh, that runs on uh, ZOS USS. Um, maybe somebody got it to work, but I don't have it. And I tried to compile it. it the whole TTY handling is completely different so uh, I didn't have that so the only the, the, if you don't have that then if you want to start the program and uh, and uh, and then keep it running if you disconnect from the terminal it will be something like that no hang up right so no up and uh, and then it will put all the output into a file or you can just say uh, you know redirect um, the uh, everything into dev null or something like that or into a log file or something like that. So <coughs> forgive, forgive me my uh, coughing. We just started in the last half an hour or so. Um, I was down at the beach. Maybe I got a little bit too much wind. Anyway, so um, 
So we got this uh, running and, and it's very simple. And now I wanted to get this to work again, but on Linux. And in Linux, you have several things. You have the environment, programming environment is of course much, much more uh, robust. Um, and uh, you have Go uh, later versions. So I have Go 19 here, uh, 119. Uh, I do have screen, right? Um, I have uh, I have very good shells, etc. Now, of course, we needed a compiler that works on, on the Linux running under um, under ZOS. Okay, so um, that's the good thing. Um, so that we are on a real Linux and uh, and. Uh, and then I needed a, an assembler, and luck has it that there is a high-level assembler for uh, Linux on the on the mainframe, and uh, it's called Asma 390. Um, I've connected here to the University of Leipzig mainframe, and uh, we're able to obtain from IBM the RPMs that go um, into this is CentOS here that I'm running. And so they were able to obtain the RPM from IBM. Uh, they have a cooperation with IBM for, um, and so I got the high-level assembler. You install it very simple, very simple with, uh, uh, etc. And then it installs. And now I wanted to do the exact same thing. In fact, I copied everything down: the web server, the HTML pages. I copied everything down. But then the problem start. First of all, um, the assembler is not called AS. The assembler is called ASMA90, as it is called also on uh, on MVS, and uh, and so okay, so I need to go and find out uh, what the, all the switches are that I need to give to ASMA90 to compile uh, a simple uh, hello. Okay, this is a very simple assembler program that I wanted to compile uh, to assemble. And I just thought I'd give it uh, uh, hello, ASM. No, okay, so it wants more. So um, it turns out the there is a very tiny little section about the uh, assembler for Linux on the mainframe, the high-level assembler um, for Linux on the mainframe by IBM. It's in the same documentation of the general high-level assembler at the very end. And uh, they have like a page and a half or two pages there, and it's terrible, uh, the terrible documentation. But uh, I was able to decipher it, and I have the incantation here. Uh, the, the invocation is something like this. So I'm just going to copy it here. Okay, Asma90, hello, we put in first the, the source file, where do you want the object, um, where you want the listing, and we're gonna look into this listing for a little bit now because there's trouble there brewing, and then the libraries that you want it to give. Um, in fact, it's, this is actually wrong. This should be like this. Very strong way to, a very strange way to concatenate macro libraries, and then the the, the options to the to the assembler itself. So if you do it like this, uh, it will execute. And now comes the funny part. Here's the listing. <laughs> this is the listing that it produces, and um, and apparently, IBM, nobody at IBM was bothered by the fact that it produces a listing in a format that is not readable on uh, on uh, Linux, and so. First, I thought it's the same thing. It would probably be some kind of different code page. And so I started to look at the code page. I, uh, there's a program that installs on every Linux called iConv. I convert, and if you do minus L, sorry, lower L, you see all the formats that iConv, uh, iConvert knows. And there is a lot of, as you can see here, IBM. We just saw a lot of IBM. Uh, grab IBM. So you have a lot of code pages there. Uh, also, it knows EPSIDIC. I tried I converting this for hours, and I couldn't get 
any sense out of this uh, out of this file so then I said okay I mean a DD has to work right so if I do DD um, hello ASCII conv ASCII then I can go to I can you know DD knows how to convert ASCII in fact that's one of the reasons DD was created was to do uh, EBCDIC to ASCII conversions and back and, and back and forth so if I look at this yeah so now we see some stuff okay um, there's a strange character here at the very beginning and uh, yeah it's it's there but look at this the first character is this and if I go to the last character uh, which in Vim is dollar sign it's this there is no line breaks at all no line breaks there's all lots of uh, characters here an eight HD hex there's control Q there's control K and yeah I mean you can remove for instance all the control uh, you can remove all the control K here by doing something like uh, control V control K okay so now that removes all the control K's but I mean this is tedious work removing all the and by the way there's no simple way to remove the control Q because if you do something in Vim like uh, control V control Q nothing happens because Q is a special character within the special characters so uh, it's a real it's a real difficult problem to get this cleaned up let's also look at this in hex uh, let's see if I remember how to do that something like that yeah so if you look at this in hex we see this C5 character at the very beginning and then um, we have this uh, 8D hex characters everywhere. Where is it? Oh, here it is. These are the 8Ds that we see everywhere. Uh, there's many of those. And so um, you can see this is real. Um, there's, there's work needed here to clean this up so that it becomes something that looks interesting and provides value in the web browser which is what we ultimately want to do right so I played with this for hours right and um, and I got this script now so same thing again remember uh, the content of whatever the user pu puts in the HTML page the source code of the assembler goes into source then I calculate a file name without the extension. Then I have only the extension here because we need to work with the file name, right? So, and then we have the file name without extension. Um, why is that? Because I want to have a script that I can just say, uh, hello, asm, as you can see here is the source code. And now I have Oh, now I have this look cleaned up. Okay. So I wanted to be able to have uh, retain just the, the file name part and then play with all the extensions. So let's see what we got here. Uh, so first we need to separate the extension from the file name. Which we did here file name is just a file name without extension extension is just extension and then we say um, we're going to assemble the source with object na na name file name dot object obviously and by the way uh, asma 90 on linux on the mainframe is able to produce elf 32-bit executables so you are able actually to create an executable file for linux from within the high level assembler so it's actually not that bad but i don't know what they were thinking about creating the list in epsidic with a strange format so then we give it the asthma library um, also i copied down 
from ZOS the macro library, which you see here. Okay, so this is the macro library of ZOS. If I take in, uh, for instance, this, you see that this is the macro for the stuff here. Um, the prefix is uh, PSA, which is important if you want to do uh, system level programming. Uh, anyway, so I have the macro library here, and as, well as I was so showing, um, we give it all the libraries that we need, so the ASMA or the high level assembly library, as well as the macro library, and then this batch size. And I set here set minus x so I can actually sh see from the shell that it's executing this command, right? I want, I want, I want, to, I want to see that, and then I. Um, unset that. So now comes the part where I first make it from EPSIDIC into ASCII, which I just showed you in the command line. Then I remove, uh, I start removing, um, well, every 132 characters I put in a line break because uh, the listing is actually made for a 1403 printer, which has 133 uh, positions but the first one is the line handling position so 132 so I do uh, basically a line break here every 132 characters and so now we have uh, file name 132 then I remove special characters characters at the very beginning of the file 5c and those 8d's that we saw right if you remember um, all these need to be removed and this one here at the very beginning So here we are. So I remove 5C and 8D and I put it in S1. Then remove only printable. We let only printable characters get in and we move, move that into S2. And then finally I remove the control K character from uh, whatever is left here. And that now becomes the new uh, listing uh, file. So hello list. And then I remove all those characters. Right, so if I do that now, I have, so you just saw before, hello, asm, and now I can go and see the listing. So that works fine. So now the only thing we need to connect is really just the, um, if you go to the web server, We need to just connect now, instead of executing the assembler here. So we still do that. And now we need to do s bash uh, and we need to give it Clean. Okay, so what it means is like we will have now in dot asm. Well, we need to change something here. Clean asm. And now we say clean asm. Assembler. And it will create now clean asm. Oh, I got it. Okay, this is how it needs to be. Okay, so it will create now in this directory clean.list and now we say uh, clean.list and if we do that uh, now if we launch that oops 
I'll screw it. Now, if we launch that here, I mean, it's got a screen session. I should be now be able to get to this. So um, let's play with this. So if I go now and go to the browser so I'm connected here now to the Xilinx instance if I go here if I put in here the simple assembler code and this is now executing the shell we just saw yes so that worked let's see where it refers to the yeah yeah so this worked exactly as we wanted we got the listing and it removed all the nasty stuff so this was actually a very simple fix um, let's yeah so this works fine submit to lasm high level assembly like get listing and uh, yeah so this works so uh, I'm glad because we got this working now for both uh, ZOS USS Unix system services which is a pain I just want to say that and then uh, we got it working for links on the mainframe which is considerably uh, simpler friendlier and uh, just simpler to work with um, and so if we go here um, we have everything ready here we have the invocation uh, which is actually wrong. Let me fix the invocation. It needs to be concatenated like this. That's the correct concatenation. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so this works fine. And uh, I'm happy that we have the high level assembler for Linux. I want to thank IBM for that. I want to question the wisdom of producing an EPSIDIC listing on a Linux machine, uh, which is going to be painful and, uh, and potentially uh, unsafe to, uh, to transform into something that the machine can read on Linux. Uh, but yeah, so but we got it working. And uh, as you can see here, you have A out. So this uh, should be executable. Yeah, so of course the assembly program does nothing, but it is able to produce L32 um, bit output. So this all works. Um, so I'm happy that we have LASM for Linux, as I mentioned. I'm happy that we can that we have uh, the high level assembly as part of the standard uh, ZOS USS environment. Um, you do need a few very simple things on USS, such as a bash. Without bash, it's really too painful to do anything. Uh, but luckily we have bash. I also have which um, I have it here I think yeah so um, which works which is kind of important also and um, and we have the Golang uh, environment for ZOS USS which is kind of important. So this is how I created my own little private, uh, assembler uh, syntax checker without having to always run a full job for that and look at the output and switch panels back and forth it's just too painful this is simple and easy I put it in a browser and a uh, second later or half a second later I'll see what the assembler said about it now there's no reason this cannot be made to work for COBOL as well and maybe I will I do have COBOL for Linux in fact, COBOL, IBM's COBOL for Linux also includes CICS APIs, so it should be fun to do. I think I'm going to do this next. But other than that, this just shows you how to set up your own um, syntax checker, browser-based, in a very simple way. Maybe in total 
400 lines of code or maybe maybe even 300 i don't know i didn't count but uh very very simple to do so i wish you all um, a great end of the year and uh, i'll see you soon again on the moshix mainframe channel if you have not subscribed yet to the moshix mainframe channel now would be a good time to do it uh, before the bits uh, wear off otherwise i'll see you in the next video thank you goodbye